What is up guys? So this podcast session is a podcast session that I filmed with Vuk, the head of growth over at Lamlist. And it's really, really interesting for both marketers and founders. For marketers, it's an interesting podcast just from the aspect of Lemlist's like journey right from zero to a hundred to where they've come right now and from a SaaS perspective it's very very interesting because they've been able to position themselves as leaders in email marketing right with a founder that is a non-tech founder so the guy isn't a coder right he's a he's a ceo etc he derived from uh marketing agencies he paused that and then he moved to Lemlist. so i personally found that really really interesting we've documented their whole journey quote unquote uh within this podcast with uh their head of growth and uh you'll basically come to realize the power of community right and how you're able to utilize community as a marketing method prior to basically prior to creating ppc campaigns or facebook campaigns and just how far your community can take you throughout your entire marketing journey um really interesting definitely recommend you watch make sure to smash the like hit the subscribe and enjoy um but other than that uh just as a brief introduction with regards to yourself so my name is kiro Costales and i run uh growth hackers inc which is a growth hacking community it's a discourse community that we started right now uh a year and a half ago i was basically so it all started with us running Growth Hackers Inc., which is a compilation of WhatsApp groups where we just started filling it up with Growth Hackers. We used to run Reddit automations on r slash Growth Hackers, driving people directly into those and uh, a lot of LinkedIn automation, driving other marketeers into the groups themselves. And uh, yeah. so far right now, it's just developed into a group of a, give or take a thousand to two thousand Growth Hackers and many other CEOs, founders and marketeers, etc. But I'd love to hear a brief introduction with regards to yourself as well. Yeah, so uh, I've been in marketing like for around six years, I guess, in total. And uh, this uh, Lemnist adventure has probably been the, one of the most exciting things to happen just because I kind of before joining Lemnist, I spent, uh, I spent it uh, in a uh, bit in an agency, I did in startup just to understand things and how things work. And after understanding that, okay, I, I like to do this, I want to focus on this, I found, uh, I tried to look for a, an early stage startup. Lemnist just finished their beta. And their AppSumo launched, the, the first version was up and running. I kind of cold emailed a cold email tool founder, which I mm. thought it was uh, <laughs> it was funny at the time. And uh, we started you know, freelancing a bit before I joined full time. And uh, I've been in these positions ever ever since. And uh, up until today, I've just crossed uh, 8 million ARR at the end of Q2. And, uh, you know, we're, we're rolling and I think uh, we have uh, an exciting product and an exciting group of people who want to do some exciting things in, in growth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's super cool. So, as a head of growth, uh, you basically mark you manage all the marketing activities of the entire firm. Yeah, 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 more or less. And the long term, so the strategic of what we're going to be doing in three to four months from now, etc. Right. Correct. So, how does your how does your average day look like? My average day uh, it depends on what day. Uh, I start the week like usually uh, with uh, meetings, strategic meetings with G, the founder. Uh, one ones with my team kind of go through deliverables i have like a specific way around these meetings uh, and uh, you know moving as as we grew our team moving from a kind of one person show two person show to a team was uh, one of the toughest things i had to do in my life to remove mm -hmm. myself operationally so it starts with meetings and kind of looking at the deliverables what we want to achieve uh, where's the progress is there something that requires my attention coaching and those kind of things and going through my day uh, and plans for the week and after that I guess the second part of the week is, is focused on execution, but I would say uh, a few hours in a day are dedicated to strategic stuff and uh, later on it's execution. I still have segments of work like product marketing, for instance, that I'm involved operationally mm -hmm. and uh, content as well. So I always kind of like divide it a bit from strategic and coaching to execution stuff. Lovely. So right now, because you're, you're basically managing a team of marketeers for you, it's more uh, coaching them, making sure that they're doing everything correctly. And then the second half of the week basically goes to execution. So whatever they're not able to do, you're, you're executing yourself. Am I right? Yeah, I wouldn't say like what they're uh, unable to do. I would rather say like what I'm trying to, to do with this team is build this culture of ownership. So mm -hmm. I always want people to own and become better, grow with the company, right? But it's also important for them to come and say, uh, hey, like we did this, it were great, maybe it can be applied to this, or hey, I tried everything, I have a situation that I need uh, your thoughts or your help with. So it's more 
coaching them to be owners of their own craft and then mm-hmm. figure it figure it out. Uh, and I'm involved operationally in the stuff that, you know, in, in the KPIs and, and uh, deliverables that are more connected to, to what I do. So we all have, have like specific stuff that we're involved in uh, and a few cross projects from time to time, obviously. God. How many people do you manage, if I can ask? Uh, currently around six and seven, depending on uh, interns. Okay. And they're, they're mostly remote or this is why you're like in Paris to, to deal with them face to face? Yeah, so we're a fully remote team, uh, but we're split. Some people are in Paris in the office where our HQ is, and uh, we have people from Serbia and Ukraine uh, mm-hmm. that work remote. So it's, I would say it's a mix, but uh, we're a remote driven company overall. And you're from Belgrade, you said, yeah? Correct. I represent. I, I really enjoyed my time in Belgrade. <laughs> uh, I spent three months there. Um, I told you I was doing like a bit of a Balkan Euro trip around Bulgaria. Then I spent some time in Belgrade, then Poland, which is out of the Balkans, etc. Wow. But uh, Belgrade. Is- if ever road takes you here again, uh, let me know. Uh, I know sure. some spots. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. It's really nice, uh, cost-wise, etc. Like uh, lifestyle as well. It's really enjoyable. But um, other than uh, other than Belgrade, of course. So you guys. Uh, Let's go back to the launch, right? The launch of Lamblist and how it all happened. Um, so there's two stages that I have questions on. So number one is the product hunt launch and then the AppSumo launch as well. You're, were, you, were you part of those or no? Uh, I joined afterwards. Uh, I joined afterwards, but shoot your questions. Uh, maybe so, I can give some notes. So before I head to those questions, one really important question that I want to ask is, um, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, uh, Gillam. Guillaume. Guillaume. All right. Guillaume. Yeah. Is, he a, uh, is he a SaaS developer himself or he's a, he's a non-tech founder? Uh, no, he's a non-tech founder. He's a growth B2B expert. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of, uh, and today uh, I'm proud to say a coach of, a coach, a coach of mine. Uh, so, he's a great in growth and marketing. Yeah. Okay. We have other two tech co-founders, but he's a non-tech one. Got you. So he partnered with the two tech founders to create Lambda. Correct. So he, yes. had, he had the vision of, this was back in 2018, 2019, of what, uh, what, what was necessary in the market. Was Snovio around there uh, or no? Or was uh, it- or I don't think so. I don't think so. But uh, what, what would, what was, what's really special with G is that uh, he spent, uh, uh, he was a previous agency owner mm-hmm. sending cold emails for clients. Mm-hmm. So he understood the industry well. He knew the problems, he saw opportunities, and obviously he just needed somebody on the tech side to you know, turn those uh, product ideas into an actual product. And VNF and so and Guillaume met at Station F uh, a bit later. G went out of his agency and then uh, you know, applied all that experience and knowledge into this and uh, into a SaaS solution. So this is, this is why you know, uh, Lambda had a cre- clear differentiation from the start, although it was, it's still like a, a heavily competitive uh, industry. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me started with personalization features that were really unique. Uh, then later moved and became kind of like a, a front runner in email vulnerability. Mm-hmm. So it was like a clear differentiation from the start and product got better today. It's even worth talking about multi-channel stuff. Mm-hmm. But thanks to that agency experience and the fact that he was always involved in, in outbound and cold emails, uh, you, see it, for, yeah. you, you, you see it a lot uh, these days. So agency owners that slowly come to... Re- I mean, there's two fronts to the to the whole thing, but you have agency owners that slowly come to realize that agencies really don't scale. So then they try to see what type of SaaS applications they can develop or courses. So it's one or the other. And then on the flip side as well, uh, the, the biggest benefit of agency owner is you're in the trenches. You're marketing every day. Correct. So the, the solution that you can launch is it's relevant above all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct, yeah. correct, correct. This is really important. And, and also like, even if you're not, uh, you know, even if you're not uh, an agency owner, if you have a community and you bid in the trenches like that, you already kind of have like a distribution network and all the feedback, which you can exactly. later transform into, into a product. But this is really key. And even later on, like we used our own product early on to grow our business. Mm-hmm. So that's another from the trenches segment that allows you to create content, unique content and have like a differentiation in, in the content marketing space since it's like a, another overcrowded thing these days. Yeah. So. I- I mean, we have a bit of a storyline like set out here, product hunt launch, AppSumo launch, and then everything that we're going to discuss right now with regards to whatever you guys are doing at the present moment. Um, but so it all started from the product hunt launch, yeah? Yeah, the product hunt launch was uh, kind of like, uh, uh, 
you know, confirming the product market fit and confirming that this is something that people would be interested in using. And uh, the smart thing there was uh, Lemus to so the three founders uh, back at that time, they started creating community right then and there. From product uh, so, launch. Exactly. So the, from, the, from the first launch, and you know, the, the first launch products are not uh, fabulous. They are there mm -hmm. to just see the demand and see the reaction. But everybody was invited to the community. Everybody participated, even after AppSumo as well, like later on, participated in giving feedback and making that product really crisp. So about summertime 2018, product was uh, already like uh, pretty stable and uh, we could start, you know, generating users. So, and then AppSumo, which was basically just a bigger product hunt launch for them, right? It, it, yeah. More community came through that, more conversions or more signups? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think uh, if, if you Google uh, on the steps, I think there's a case study uh, out there as well. But uh, we did that to generate some revenue, obviously, but also to drive new sets of users and uh, get more feedback and uh, everything that comes with it. Okay, so um, I'd also like your input on this. So when I was reading one of, uh, we'll call him G, because Guillaume, I'm, I'm going to butcher his name, he's going to hate this session. Uh, uh, I was reading... Office. So I was reading one of his uh, Medium posts on how he basically grew Lemlist and the MRR showcasings and the ARR, yeah. etc. And he mentioned that one of the initial mistakes that Lemlist did was going after enterprise clients when they were too small. Can you shed some yeah. light on it? Because for me, as an outsider, it makes perfect sense to go to enterprise clients. As a matter of fact, enterprise would even work out a little bit better than uh, just the, the, the conventional emailer that's going to subscribe for $40 a month and then they're going to have a bunch of requests, right? What's your, yeah. what's your position on that? Yeah, but it, it depends, man. I, th I think it, it comes down to uh, a specific industry and a specific client. Uh, so the way Lamlist works is you have to be, you know, uh, agile. There's no complex onboarding. There's no complex training. Mm -hmm. You just have to come in, set it up, organize your team pretty much on demand, uh, if we can call it like this. And uh, the first time uh, G and I met when I went to Paris for the first time at Station F back in the day, uh, I listened to some of the meetings as we were in the same room. And uh, usually there's a lot of paperwork involved. There's like uh, longer sales cycles and a lot of time of that you have to invest. But then you're small and lean. There's support, there's community, there's marketing. There's a lot of things that you have to think about. And uh, sometimes for, for some products, it doesn't really make sense uh, to go and invest that amount of time if uh, more exponential growth is on the other side with SMBs, mm -hmm. you know, kind of entrepreneurs, uh, sales teams and uh, growth teams, etc. Mm -hmm. So Makes that sense. is the case. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, so in that case, it was more a, it was more a topic of, uh, right, so our time is being focused on enterprise right now. The deal might close, it might not, but at the same time, a lot of opportunity cost on the SMB side. So it's more of an opportunity. Cost. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's opportunity cost plus you also you know I think like the way Lamlist works as a product and the, you know with everything involved, it's more suited for SMBs and kind of these teams that can adapt quickly. They mm -hmm. don't need a lot of training and they can just go and roll with it. Of course, we have you know companies like Zendesk, for example, using it. So it, it still works. It just depends on the mindset of a prospect and kind of creating this win-win solution. So for us to be successful, they need to be be able to win and not overcomplicate their life. So we kind of always set that, you know, expectation from the start. And if, if the prospect, no matter the size is interested, we can, we can get talking, but SMBs are, are more of a, of a focus for, for Lemlist. So you're, for those that aren't aware as well, your SMB solution, simple sign up, right? Purchase with cards. So direct Stripe checkout, and then that's it. They're set up. Yeah, follow exactly. Up. Exactly. Follow yeah. You have a free trial and then sign up usual sales drill. Right. And then the, uh, the enterprise flow, how does that work? And what does the, what, what does the end product look like as a solution for an entire company? It's just more seats and then maybe consulting on the setup or an, a consulting package on DKIM setup, spoof setup, et cetera. How does it look? Uh, yeah, I guess the answer is, is boring, but it will depend uh, on the specific needs. Like it, there's never like additional customization of the product itself. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, what we, we have like a dedicated sales team. So it might involve meeting a few decision makers in the company, uh, maybe giving some advice around the ability and the perfect setup, uh, but also like keeping that communication ongoing as they become a client. So, you know, hear their thoughts, hear their feedback. And if a 
their feedback matches kind of the product roadmap. It, you know, it's still valuable and we want to make it happen. But usually the difference is in the number of meetings and potentially more complex topics, if more seats are involved, more people are involved, deliverability decisions are a bit more complex. Uh, mm-hmm. So giving them advice and kind of kind of onboarding with them, or at least delivering them the right set of, of, of you know the content pieces that that can help them have something for for their team as well. Set noted. So yeah, I think it's. Um, do you, do you guys think that you've tapped into the enterprise uh, segment of the market as much as you can at the moment, or do you think there's more space for for growth and development there? Yeah, I'm a firm believer there's always like a place for growth, but mm-hmm. uh, there's like a lot of uh, enterprises that can potentially benefit from Lambda. But like I said, the main focus is more on, on uh, SMBs and kind of bootstrapping companies and uh, uh, leaner and meaner sales teams. But if we can help an enterprise here and there, similar to what we did with Zendesk, because Zendesk experienced a lot of success mm-hmm. uh, with us and we're really happy to have them as a client. So there's always a way. Uh, as long as we know, uh, <laughs> it's a win-win scenario. Mm-hmm. So, okay, Seth, then just further into the story of where you are right now with uh, your marketing campaigns and how you're driving traffic to yourself. Uh, you guys aren't running any PPC campaigns, correct? Uh, we don't, but we've run one, uh, uh, like in the past two months, we've launched the second masterclass. So we mm-hmm. have like masterclasses besides the product. And with the LinkedIn masterclass, we tested PPC. But for Lemlist, apart from like a 10-day experiment just for fun, nothing serious has been done. Can I ask why? Is it the is it the cost? Is it the fact that you always have the community there and you're thinking, why spend money on some other marketing channel when our community is, you know, hungry for the product and we could just spend time there? What is it? It's, I think it's just like analyzing the resources that we have, uh, depending like on the stage that we're talking about or quarter and then matching, okay, these are, we believe that this will make this kind of impact and we have limited uh, amount of resources that we can invest. PPC and every channel, I'm a, like I'm a also a believer in uh, everything works as long as you know how to use it. So PPC is something that looks uh, interesting now uh, as an opportunity to reach more people. But back in the time it was, we focused our efforts on something that was more uh, where we were really the strongest, which was brand building, community, content, um, giving people as many as much as actionable value as possible and helping them win with outreach. Uh, and we focused it there because it was, it, it was like a lot like time consuming as hell. Uh, but PPC, for example, something like an Ahrefs strategy where they boost content in mm-hmm. order to reach mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Uh, is something that uh, we can look in, uh, we can look into into the future. But back in the time, it was uh, just a decision, prioritization, and stuff like that. Noted. And no Facebook ads either. So no, no, we didn't, we didn't run any ads uh, except recent masterclass sprint, uh, which was like a basic webinar, and then later the course push. So what's the flow of the masterclass that you're doing? Basically, it's uh, it's let's say it's offering a free course. So just like info firsthand, uh, it's a it's a webinar, and then you're offering information with regards to how to cold email, and then you're plugging Lemlist towards the end. What's the structure with regards to that? Okay, so with the masterclasses, since all our content experience and the fact that we really like a content-driven company, and I really don't mean this as a cliche, we really created like a course that's actionable as hell, but only after making LinkedIn work for us and having LinkedIn as a major contributor to our growth and, uh, you know, inviting other people to our webinars and all that and learning everything. So we combined all that knowledge, created a really good masterclass. But prior to launching that masterclass, we started with an ebook, which was called LinkedIn Content Secrets. Mm-hmm. Used our distribution networks and everything, so typical lead gen ebook stuff. Uh, pushed everything in customer.io, did some light enrichment uh, if uh, you know we spot some so somebody interesting. And then we started with the Facebook ads promoting that ebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, uh, there was like sequences pushing the webinar. Webinar was kind of the cushion between the course uh, and people. So webinar is something that will give you value and kind of give you a more broader. A strategic or your things, you still get value, but the masterclass go into the smallest of details. And so the ads in this particular example were first pushing the ebook. When the webinar was closed, then they would start to push the webinar. Uh, and ultimately, we did some retargeting to uh, promote the, the course itself when we launched the course. Mm-hmm. So this is um, 
just from my perspective, I'm not sure if you had the time to check out the YouTube channel that we have, but that's essentially how we started. So we just, mm -hmm. our first video was Phantom Buster, right? There was no videos on how to use Phantom Buster. You had this kick-ass tool just sitting there and everybody's like, what do we do with it? Uh, so our first couple of videos yeah. were just showcasing basically how to use Phantom Buster. Over time, this spread onto other tools like Scrapebox, then in some cases, custom-made tools and just full-out strategies. Because um, there's... Again, you have these SaaS solutions, right? The founders think that putting in, I don't know, three months of their time into product development is enough. But I personally feel like an additional four to five or six months has to be put into just developing the guides of how to use the product. Otherwise, it's it's just, it's gone to waste. So the YouTubers that, you know, the, the B2B marketers that do this, they have space for growth. Uh, you guys are evidently kicking it up so you're getting the you're getting the thing in motion right now i noticed on your youtube channel six days ago you guys uploaded like uh, i don't know 15 or 10 different videos on dkim setup spoof setup <laughs> setup etc so you guys are really getting the ball rolling with the content marketing yeah yeah Con content marketing is the alpha and omega of Lemus. to be honest with you it was from the day one so sharing templates you know like for example when you googled cold email templates uh two years ago you would find here the bit generic and it didn't have data. So you kind of felt, okay, did the creator of this temple, template actually send this template in the past? Right. Uh, so this was, a, this was a differentiation opportunity in the content space. This is, I guess, how you win in content. Uh, so we started producing cold email templates. Later, this became a hub where our users uh, shared their templates and what they were using. We were creating kind of like a win-win partnerships with them, giving them uh, exposure to our network which was specifically interesting for an agency that, you know, does lead gen, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for instance. Uh, and then it expanded, you know, now there are people who have vlogs kind of like top of the funnel content. So our head of sales and uh, Nadja and Simon, they have uh, their sales vlog. Guillaume has his vlog. Vianney, our CTO, has his vlog. And every vlog is kind of this top of the funnel, wonderful thing uh, with a specific goal in mind. And later, you know, you move people down the funnel with more in-depth guides and tactical actionable stuff. Uh, and uh, YouTube from the Lemless, from the so Lemless official channel, it's something that we've used in the past, but uh, we put a pause, I guess, beginning of 2021. Why is and that? Our uh, resource, just resources and some content stuff that we were pushing. We had some virality campaigns and it wasn't just uh, apart from product marketing and some videos for product. It, it, we didn't really have the time to do it, but now uh, we're doing it again and uh, we kind of see this as a Lemless TV and uh, uh, something, uh, I think there are a lot of cool things that we can do with this YouTube, uh, push and, uh, definitely, definitely. the, the, the potential for boring B2B subjects that, you know, we cover essentially on YouTube uh, is absolutely crazy because there's search volume for it and there's just low competition because yeah. nobody can be bothered to make a video about, you know, D mark setup. It's like, who cares? Uh, that's what they think, but the volume is there, right? Yeah. If you use yeah. tools like TubeBuddy or vidIQ, you can definitely see that there is search trend. Uh, now, one of my uh, I'm also captured to Google, right? From Google. Oh, exactly. Not only YouTube, yeah. Exactly. Uh, one of my best performing videos is how to how to warm up your email, basically. So we don't even use our solution. We use a uh, warm up inbox from another guy. It's it's another SaaS solution for some. I have to convert you to Lamborn. Yeah. So one of the just from a product perspective, um, it's I've considered it numerous times uh, to convert myself to Lamborn. But the, the pricing just doesn't make sense because you have these other solutions for seven bucks, right? Whereas Lemworm, I might be a bit in the history of your pricing model, but before it was priced at uh, 30 bucks, if I'm not mistaken, per inbox. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, 29. Uh, but uh, the, you, like one thing that, that Lemworm is the top is this is the first solution of, of its kind and it mm -hmm. has uh, various domain age, uh, a lot of uh, reputable companies helping you warm up the main. It's proven to bring results. It doesn't make mistakes. Uh, we've seen like thousands of people uh, really boost their email durability. And honestly, it, it's not me saying it. This is, you know, Google it. Um, it's the top warm up solution out there and the one you can trust. So you're kind of warming up your domain with people from Zendesk. Uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, valuable emails and everything. If you ever, I don't want to be pushing anything, but if you ever decide to test it, uh, let me know. And, no, uh, I, I, I agree 100%. The pool of the actual emails within the, the pool itself is super important. Yeah, this is and they need to be real. You know, you need, they need to be real. They need to be like exactly. uh, valid because 
writers will look that. And uh, if you make a mistake, it's kind of, you know, not having wheels on your car. It's not going to end well. Agreed 100%. Now let's get to the, um, I think this is the most important uh, marketing channel for you guys. It's community, right? So it's the Facebook group, it's the newsletter, etc. cetera. Um, what are some insights that you can share with regards to that? Of course, starting from how important it is for Lemlist and then how you nurture it, how you keep a community, how you grew it, et cetera. Because personally speaking, I'm a very big fan of online communities. I think that they're the, it's most likely the number one, their number one channel. It's hard to get them going. It's very easy to maintain them once you get them started. Uh, but above all, it gives you a marketing and distribution channel that you own. You don't yeah, need yeah, to rent yeah, ad space yeah, yeah. on Facebook anymore. You don't need to yeah, rent yeah. ad space on Google, etc. Sure, for sure, for sure. It's it's your own real estate, uh, which makes it uh, a lot of fun. So. Uh, if I give you like, since I saw the, the timing, um, uh, if I give you like a fast overview, um, initially it was a great way to streamline feedback. So mm -hmm. Lamborn was an idea from the community and became like a, a differentiator, uh, you know, for, for our product and a separate pricing plan. So streamlining feedback, uh, creating additional value to people, uh, distributing your content in a smart way, you know, not distributing every piece you create, but distributing stuff that helps people. Uh, making it a place to network, uh, making it a place to, to place to invite sales experts, organize exclusive events, and give your give your uh, members an opportunity to ask uh, guys like you know Aaron Ross or Rand Fishkin or whoever uh, some questions about funnels. We had recently people from Zoominfo or Aircall uh, sharing their stuff. So I think community is a great additional way to you know provide value to people, create something like uh, where people are really excited to be in. You know, potentially find the client, find a, a partner for something, or find the best tool and see what kind of uh, funnels can you set up. But also as a distribution network and uh, uh, potential, like a you know, a promotion, not non-salesy promotion of your product, if I can say it like this. Of course. So you guys used it to assist in the building of Lemlist first and foremost, right? Because you had direct exposure to the market and what they're looking for. Yeah. Saw, yeah. Um, I saw yeah. the segment uh, that G posted about the UX design fail that they had initially and how they used yeah. the community to get back on their feet ASAP. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's like, it's, it's like uh, the number one goal, and I really mean every word I say, is cre like creating the bond with our users, but also people who are not our users, but uh, are an active uh, members of the community. And then, you know, uh, just giving them value and Lamlist being a valuable tool will find its position in a non intrusive way. So you don't have to use Lamlist to be a part of a community, but uh, it gives us an opportunity to position our, our product for sure. But the main idea is always uh, producing value and uh, giving uh, salespeople inspiration to grow their own business. From a, a final question as well, and I, I think it'd be an interesting question for you guys. Uh, from a competitor analysis perspective, how are you guys dealing with somebody like Snovio, for instance? Like, what's the what's the strategy there? Would you call them a competitor to begin with? Uh, I think like they're they are maybe not the direct one, uh, considering like that we're into multi-channel and uh, how you know how Lemlist evolved over time. But there's like a lot of indirect competitors, now you're being one of them. Uh, I don't think like our strategy was the same regardless of, uh, of a competitor, which is build a top product uh, that has a clear differentiation. For us, it was personalization and email vulnerability. And really, I think, you know, every new competitor this comes into a field, like there's a lot of stuff that we went through uh, and, you know, all the knowledge that we gathered and invest in those features. So the top product was always something really important when you have like a top product then growth is much easier mm -hmm. uh, and our growth strategy was always like producing valuable content uh, creating a strong brand so most of our traffic traffic comes from branded search uh, which is for us uh, uh, super important mm -hmm. and uh, you know community from day one uh, and probably one of the biggest sales communities out there uh, these are you know the stable pillars and then you add LinkedIn and the fact that in the company everybody is active on LinkedIn and that we invest a uh, humongous amount of time in creating and building relationships with prospects. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that is kind of our competitive advantage, I would say, features and the team. So 
uh, this is how we fight any competitor really with uh, super features and a team that's you know eager to grind Lamlist owns Lampod, right? It used to. Lampod was acquired. You sold it out, uh, right? Yeah. Got you. So for those that are unaware as well, Lampod is, I think it was the first LinkedIn engagement pod, if I'm not mistaken. So you paid Correct. five bucks and you had access to yeah, yeah small niches. It yeah. worked really well. It worked really well yeah. until people stopped editing the comments. And then it's like it became super transparent with regards to who was uh, using pods and who was not. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I mean, it still works. I mean, I guess it can still work. Uh, I'm not using it anymore. I've used it in the past when, when it was ours. But uh, you, you just have to pick your pods in a smart way. Yeah. And uh, do it like this. But uh, ultimately, we, we sold it. Agreed. Agreed. Set. All right, Vuk. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm, we're we're going to edit it. We'll send you the final version as well if you guys want to repost, post within your communities, etc. But all in all, it was a pretty good one. Uh, so we covered the we covered the key things that you guys are doing. We, one of the key things is that you guys aren't really ad heavy and it's more community heavy at the end of the point, uh, which I personally find super interesting. Um, I think this segment is going to be super helpful for anybody who's in a SaaS development space right now and they're looking for the next steps forward. Uh, like how to attach themselves to a community so as to develop a better product, etc. where to launch. So you guys mentioned Product Hunt AppSumo. I think it was a good uh, session nonetheless. So yeah, I had, a, I had a lot of fun and uh, I'm honestly pumped to meet you. Yeah, I feel like we're on the same kind of vibe. Uh, 100%. So if we ever cross roads, uh, beers on me and uh, thank you for inviting me, man. I really thank appreciate you so much, it. Man. Thank you so much. We'll stay in touch. Yeah, see ya. Bye.